Hello, there we go. It's uh, five o'clock in the afternoon, Central European time. And welcome everyone. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, wherever you are on this wonderful planet. And welcome in this new webinar, the webinar about the new WebCore version 2.0 that is coming up. And so I'm happy you are here. Make this your webinar because, of course, you're here. This is an interactive webinar, so don't hesitate to uh, ask questions. There is um, in the right bottom corner the questions tab, the chat tab. Um, so in these places, you can leave your questions. So, of course, we are going to spend about an hour together um, and talking about what's coming up in WebCore 2.0. And here is an overview of the different areas where we did improvements in WebCore. First of all, we uh, integrated the latest pass to js compiler and the uh, RTL updates that go with it. There is a lot of focus on new components, new controls, so we are going to have a look at that as well. And of course, the existing components also got numerous enhancements that we are going to have a look at. There are a couple of framework improvements underlying how the components work together. There's also um, improvement in the area of the IDE integration. And finally, we also exposed some new browser APIs um, to make your application integrate even better with uh, the browser. So let's uh, go over this topic by topic. And the first one is the pass to js compiler, which will be compiler version 2.3.1 and the RTL that goes with it. If you have an interest to see um, the evolution of this compiler and RTL, I invite you to visit the link on freepascal.org that is shown here on the slides. With respect to a compiler and the progress of the compiler, uh, it is the intention to make the pass to js compiler as compatible as possible with the Delphi compiler. We are working closely together with the developers working on the pass to js compiler. Um, several things are still in the pipeline. A lot, a lot has already been covered in the past years of pass to js development, but a few things are planned and coming, which is uh, extended RTTY operator overloading and anonymous records. A couple of other things that are in the Delphi compiler, but not yet in the pass to js compiler are mentioned here on the list. And we'll keep in touch with uh, the pass to js team and see uh, to move also these things forward in the future. And now let's uh, focus on um, one major part in uh, the new WebCore version 2.0, which is a lot of controls that have been added. And this here is a list of new components you will find in version 2.0. So there is the country list box, combo box, and drop down. There is a checklist control, a CSS class, an edit control with attached button, a search edit, a drop down control and an editable drop down control and also a db aware list control and finally we also significantly enhanced the xlsx import export component and integrated it directly in um, webcore 2.0 so um, let's have a look together at um, these new components that are in WebCore 2.0. So here we have uh, Delphi, in this case on this machine is uh, Delphi 10.4 with an uh, empty WebCore application. And when I'm having a look at the new country combo box, list box and drop down, typing country under two palette reveals uh, 
these three new components. So I have a combo box and a list box. Here is the list box. Let's make it somewhat bigger. And we also have the country dropdown. Let's first see what happens when I compile the application with the components as is on this form. So I compile and run this application. You can see here in the bottom of the screen, the pass to GS compiler to 3.1. And of course, it's WebCore 2.0 and the result appears here in the browser and as you can see we have this list box we also have a combo box from where you can pick countries and there is this drop down control in this drop down control we have things like uh, lookup so you can quickly pick an country and as you can see each country has been uh, preceded with the flag of the country. Um, a little uh, technical tidbit behind that is that this, uh, these icons are coming from CSV. So if I inspect in my uh, browser console and we have a look at what is added to have access to these flags, you can see here that this has been automatically referenced when I added these country combo boxes or controls. Um, and you can see uh, the CSS that is responsible and that holds uh, its actual SVG information for each of these flags. It's all done automatically as soon as you add these controls on the form. So, um, Let's now maybe remove these guys and have a look at the new uh, checklist component. This is the new checklist component. And very similar to the VCL checklist box, we have an items property like this. And here we can add names. For example, and let's add one more name. I add our friend Holger. And so this is the checklist. There is, of course, an event that is triggered when a checkbox is uh, clicked. So here I can add the message box like this. So let's uh, run this uh, application. And it feels, behaves, uh, and also in terms of interface coding, it is um, exactly as it is in a uh, VCL application. So here it is. I can click this checkbox and you can see that um, the appropriate checkboxes get checked when I click them. All right. So this is already the first number of new controls that were added. I will now clean up this uh, form so I can bring the new drop-down controls in focus. And there is the new PWeb drop-down control. And there is also the new Blitz drop-down control. So the difference is that the, either this contains an editor or it's just an area where you can put information, static information such as uh, text or an image or whatever HTML that you want. Uh, the main or the, the most important feature here is that um, this drop-down control has a control property. And that means that I can drop whatever control on the form, like this web panel. I can assign this to control. 
to the web panel, we assign it to the drop down control property. And when I run this, the control will manage that this panel appears when I click the drop down button on the control. So let's uh, bring this up in our browser. And as you can see, when I click the drop down button, this panel appears. So that means that you actually have uh, the full freedom to connect whatever control to this drop down control and you can make it appear when uh, the drop down button is clicked. And I've created an uh, example like this with a um, checklist, the new checklist control that we use from the drop down control. So let's have a look at the project that I prepared for this. So this is um, the drop down control. And here we have a separate web checklist box with some uh, country um, short names added to this uh, checklist control. There's also some code added here. So what we do is we have initialized the drop down control static text in this case because it's not a web edit drop down control it's just a regular web drop down control and this text got initialized to the short names for germany and belgium and when we click um, a checkbox so the check click handler of the checklist here as you can see um, this will retrieve the checked items of this uh, checklist box control and assign these to the text of the drawdown control, the static text. When we run this and see this in action, everything will become clear. How we could simply hook up two controls and make kind of new control from these two controls. So here, we have the drop down control. When I click it, I see the checklist uh, dropping down. And here I can uh, check other items uh, as I want. And I have an, a drop down checklist control created out of these two controls. But we can go a step further and also tie a uh, table control to this uh, drop down control and also make it editable, for example. So I open this uh, small project that I created to illustrate this. Here we go. So what we have here is the edit dropdown control in this case. And we also have a uh, table control. And in the click event of that table control, we set the text in this drop-down control to the value of the cell in the first column of the table control, the first column of the row that was clicked. We also initialize here the table control with some sample data. So that's a one line code instruction to have at least some data into this table control. Let's run this application. There is nothing more to this um, application and these two lines of code. And so when I run this, let's bring it on the main screen here and I press drop down, you can see that the table control becomes uh, visible in the drop down and I can select here and uh, it's also editable. I can change the value, for example, and uh, click another row to select another value. So this is an example of how we can hook up a table control and use it as a dropdown. Um, also here in this um, example, uh, this example has been using Bootstrap because um, the Bootstrap is used to um, make the table control render more beautiful with hover effect, etc. So um, also bootstrap can be combined with this um, drop down control. You can see 
if I go to manage JavaScript libraries in the project manager, When it comes up, where is it? Okay, there it is. You can see here that uh, Bootstrap 5 uh, has been checked. This is the Bootstrap library that I'm using for this sample project. Another new component that uh, I want to introduce now is a sort of um, visual CSS component. Let's open the demo that I prepared for this. Okay, here it is. And so we have this non-visual component, uh, the CSS class component, and here we have an HTML diff on the form. What we have in the CSS component is um, numerous properties that relate to possible CSS uh, styles that can be set. So you can see a lot of border customization, background color customization, shadows that can be applied, uh, everything that um, applies to fonts, uh, margins, padding or uh, is there uh, all kinds of control of how the text is rendered. Uh, so all this is accessible from the object inspector. And the most important property is the CSS class name. So you can also in a red way uh, set the CSS class for this um, component. And how we hook up the CSS for this component to the diff on the form that is by setting the element class name for our diff uh, component on the form to the name of the CSS class, in this case, my CSS. And so um, you can see here that this is just a regular rectangle uh, diff, with not much else. Uh, I also have uh, some code edit that shows that you can also manipulate the CSS by code. So what I'm doing here is just change the CSS background color uh, style setting. And when I have set the color, I perform the update CSS and that's it. So let's have a look how this um, renders when the CSS of this CSS component is applied to the HTML diff. Let's bring it in focus here. And you can see that uh, several CSS styles have been applied to this um, diff. And when I click modify CSS, you can see that it changed to the yellow background color. We can also see when we inspect a little bit deeper the CSS class that we have here, uh, the border, where is it? The border radius that is, that is set to 10 and that is responsible for creating rounded borders. We have this background color that has been used and we have here also the border color. We wanted a red color and uh, a width of two pixels. If we wanted some shadow, for example, uh, we could give it some shadow setting, so horizontal and a vertical offset of um, eight. And let's add some blur. And I think that should be kind of sufficient. So I manipulated the CSS class Let's recompile and see the effect of applying CSS-based shadow on this uh, HTML diff. When I bring it here on the screen, this is the result that you can see on the form. So you can drop numerous uh, CSS class components on the form. You could also uh, drop these on a data module and share these throughout your application and control from there uh, several uh, CSS styles 
that you use throughout in connection with your controls in your application. That allows you to manipulate CSS in a red way rather than doing it by editing the CSS uh, directly in the CSS file or directly in line in your HTML file. Also, um, the XLSX components, so the component for importing and exporting XLSX files has been significantly enhanced. And uh, here is a demo showing what uh, has been added. So whereas before uh, we had a basic, simple, um, and, and separately installable XLSX component. This is now integrated into Webport 2.0. And um, the most important here is that we exposed a lot of access to cell property. So the cell color alignment, the borders, and all these kind of things are now accessible. Whereas in uh, before this was strictly importing and exporting um, cell text into a grid. Now this is also usable in connection with um, without a grid, for example. So you can um, get access to cell information and properties from a loaded XLSX file or uh, set cell information without using a grid or um, this here is a web string grid, but you could also, for example, use an FNC grid um, to access the um, information or to show the information in the XLSX file into uh, the grid of your preference. And if we have a look at the code here, this code is a little bit uh, larger. Uh, here you can see the fill cells um, method. This is the method that is called when the XLSX has been loaded. So if we have a look at uh, the code. You can see here that when the XLSX file has been loaded, it calls fill cells. And so let's inspect what uh, fill cells is doing. Here it is. So it actually loops over all rows and columns in the XLSX file. And it will, in this case, fill the grid with the information found in the XLSX cells. So the cell as text is set into the um, grid. But here we also access each cell as an object. And from that object, we can get uh, things such as a font style, which you uh, can see here. Also uh, the alignment of the text. And here in this demo, we have also uh, covered the borders, so border information is also retrieved. And finally, also background color. There is uh, actually more information uh, in connection to uh, the cells. But here in this demo, this is what we have covered. And this is the XLSX file that we are going to uh, load in this uh, demo. So let's open it separately in uh, Microsoft Excel. So you can see here that we used some font color, background color, um, alignment, and also uh, font styles. So let's see what happens when we um, load this XLSX file in this demo. Let's compile the demo and have a look at the results. The same applies, of course, for exporting to XLSX. You have access to the cell objects in the XLSX file and then choose to perform the export and it will generate an XLSX file with the settings as you did. And as you can see here um, in our web string grid, the standard string grid component that comes with uh, WebCore, uh, you can see that it retrieved and rendered the information as is in the XLSX file. So this is related to the new XLSX component integrated in WebCore 2.0. And that 
is what we have for today, what I covered today uh, for new components. What I did not show yet is the new uh, search edit. That's kind of trivial what it is in the web edit button. So let's create a new application and on the search edit on the form and the web edit button on the form. These are the controls. So that's a typical search area that you find in so many uh, web applications. You have it all out of the box here. And in this uh, search edit, when we have a look at the properties, it comes with a default preset search icon and clear icon. Uh, but there is also a um, property for setting a custom search image or setting a custom clear button image, uh, which you can see here. But let's stick with the defaults and have a look how this uh, looks and feels in the browser. So from now on, this is how it looks and feels. So from now on, you also uh, can search directly from the control, click the search button, click the clear button. And of course, there is an event on clear click and also on search click that you can act on uh, when you want to integrate this into your application. So this is um, what I had prepared for showing you the new controls that come with WebCore 2.0. Let's now have a look at uh, the main new features that we added in several existing components that are part of WebCore. First of all, we added row selection to the web table control or the DB aware uh, table control. Um, so it is sensitive. You can enable that it will be sensitive to clicks on rows and it will show you the selected row in the control and you can retrieve what uh, row was selected. We have also added filtering for the web list control. Note that the web list control is by preference uh, used in combination with Bootstrap. And when you use Bootstrap, there are several styles for rendering the list control. The filtering will apply to all of these styles. Um, and so you can uh, apply simple or easy filtering of items in this uh, list control. We also added new uh, required and required text properties to uh, several edit controls, and these can be used for form validation. So it uh, will perform standard browser-based uh, validation of the inputs in these controls and show a message when uh, the control is empty and an empty value cannot be accepted. We also did uh, several enhancements in the web rich edit as well as the toolbar that goes with the web rich edit. Um, on web rich edit level, we added uh, things like inserting images, controlling the line spacing, uh, having clipboard shortcuts uh, work. So. Uh, all these announcements are in the web rich edit. Both in the table control and the string grid, we added several um, types of uh, controls that you can add to cells. And this includes button checkbox and progress bar, where we add uh, methods to directly add these control types to a cell in the table control or the string grid. That, of course, does not prevent you from doing further customization, which was already available through an event that uh, allows you to fully uh, control and insert whatever HTML that you want into a table control cell or a web string grid cell. But here we just made it uh, somewhat easier by adding uh, methods for you that allow you to directly add this and without bothering about um, the HTML that uh, is needed for this. 
We also added built-in sorting for the table control and the string grid. So you can control at column level where the sorting can be performed. And uh, the table control and string grid will perform the sorting as you click on sort uh, up or down icons in the column headers. Also new is uh, checkboxes and radio buttons in the web tree view. So uh, along with a note, you can now also have checkboxes and radio buttons. Um, the DB combo box has also be in, been enhanced and now it features a list source and list field property that allows you to directly load the items of the combo box from a data set. And uh, we also added material icon support for the web page control captions. But it will speak for itself as we have a look at small demos that I prepared for um, these several new features. Let's start off by list filtering. So this is a demo. It's using a bootstrap. This is a list control. You can see here several bootstrap classes that uh, will define how this list control is being rendered. And I added several items to the list control. There's also an edit control. And what I did in this um, change event handler is simply remove any uh, filter that might have been set before and specify a new filter. This uh, contains the, filter, the text to filter on and the second parameter is uh, defines whether the filtering is case sensitive or not. So when I run this application, we will see it in action. And let's move it to the main screen so that you can see the output. So here you see the uh, list control with a style that comes from a bootstrap. And now when I click or when I enter some uh, letter, you can see that it filters as I'm typing text um, in this list control. So it um, is hard to make it easier like this, just two lines of code and um, you can have filtering in the list control and of course, it applies to whatever style of rendering for the list control that you have chosen. Let's have a look how the uh, required and required text behave. Um, and these properties have been added to um, the web edit control, the web edit button control, and also the web spin edit. To make this work in the browser, to make the required feature of an HTML input element work, uh, these controls need to be added to an HTML form. As you can see here, you can see here that uh, they are on the HTML form component and the validation is happening on form submit. Form submit is what happens when you click a button that has the button type submit. So this has been preset here to uh, submit. So let's uh, run and see what's happening. No other code was uh, added in this uh, demo. Let's see the results. Okay, so when I click submit, you can see that the browser uh, shows us that a value is required. All uh, components, as you can see, have uh, the required property set. And here we have also added some custom required text. So for each uh, component, you can specify a different uh, required text. So here you can see the name must be entered. So when I add some name and do a 
submit again. Here it had expected a city. So when we add a city and we make this one empty, then you can see that here an other text appears to show uh, what is required as input for this control. So that brings us to uh, the enhancements that were done to the rich editor control. And these are here. Also, this demo has uh, no code. We have the rich edit toolbar which is connected via the rich edit property to the rich edit control. And you will notice extra capabilities from the toolbar that you can directly interact with. So let's bring it on the screen. Here it is. And here you can see um, the new buttons to insert a new image or this one this is the one that controls line spacing so that's the text and then for example we can pick um, an image let's see where we can find some image okay here is a PNG file, so uh, this is the PNG file that was um, or is, is added to the rich edit control. If you have a smartphone ready, um, then you can simply scan the QR code. It will bring you to our website. And if I add some of lines, I can also control here the line spacing uh, which is also a uh, new feature okay and this was the improvements that concerned the rich editor let's uh, move now to the enhancements for the string grid more specifically to the controls that you can now more easily add to our string grid and what I show here also applies to the table control. So if we have a look at uh, the code here you can see that um, I add a checkbox in cell 11, add a button in cell 22 and add a progress bar with the progress position of 50 to cell 33. Finally what I am also doing to show you how you can interact with these is I have a track bar control and from the track bar I'm updating the progress position based on the track bar position. So let's run this um, application. And see this results so this initializes the grid so you can see that a checkbox has been added i have also added an event handler for checkbox and button clicks and here you see the progress bar with position 50 or 50 percent and so when i change here on my track bar this uh, progress bar is also updated and that brings us to the new sorting capability that is in the string grid that I show you in another small demo project that focuses on this specific feature. So what do we have here? We have a, a string grid on the form. That's it, nothing more. And in the code, all we have is an initialization of data to quickly have some data in the grid. 
and then I simply add the sort indicator for all columns in the grid. Um, of course, if I skip a column or only add this to one column, only one column will be sortable. So you can control this way uh, what columns can be sorted and what columns not. Here, in this case, I simply loop over all columns, all um, non-fixed uh, columns, so to say, and uh, make all these columns sortable by adding a sort indicator. So as you can see, this is um, the, the place from where you trigger the sorting. So when I click on it, you see uh, that the color changes. It shows you the active column uh, where sorting has been applied. So also here, no code to add. The grid does everything by itself and performs the sortings on the columns where you will want to have this. So these are the main enhancements that have been done on the grid and also the table uh, control. The sorting is also in the table control as well as adding controls to table control cells. Everything is available in both new controls. I also mentioned that from now on we can have checkboxes and radio buttons on nodes in the tree view. And this is demonstrated here with a code snippet. So what I'm doing here is adding a main node to the tree view and adding two child nodes, child node one and two. And on the node type property for the added child node, I can specify that it should be a checkbox. And under an other main node, I have radio buttons. And here uh, I specify the node type as radio button. So it's as simple as that to um, also have the availability of checkboxes and radio buttons in a tree view control. And seeing this in action, I create the tree view. And obviously, when I open these uh, nodes, I'm getting the checkboxes that I expect or the radio button. And you can see that obviously the radio button uh, takes in account the child nodes under one main node to make the radio button radio group behavior under that node automatically. All right, these are um, the main uh, new features that we added in components. There are numerous uh, smaller features in uh, lots of other controls, but we focused for this uh, webinar on the main new features added in controls. Let's have a look now at another part, which is uh, framework improvements. Underlying framework has been um, also improved in several areas. For example, we added uh, the brush style. So um, before this was not yet available in uh, WebCore, uh, a brush style that is similar to what is available in the VCL, where you have um, possibility to have a solid style, clear style, or a diagonal or horizontal or vertical um, lines uh, drawing as brush style. So it works uh, in the same way as the VCL brush style is working. Reason actually why this was not yet before in uh, WebCore is that uh, in HTML5 canvas uh, drawing, uh, there is no such thing that directly maps on the VCL brush style. So we had to do a custom implementation to make this possible to have it um, compatible with how VCL behaves. We have application.active property that you can check if uh, the browser where your application is running has a focus. If it's an active window with the focus uh, on your application, uh, that's a simple Boolean property that you can check. It's obviously a read-only property. 
We also added support for material icon styles. So material icons, the Google material icons have several styles. We'll have a look in a moment. Um, before there was only um, the default uh, icon style, but now uh, all the additional styles can be directly selected from the IDE. In the web element action list, we also added support for handling touch and wheel events. This was not yet available. We also have auto translation of text in the message dialogue call. Uh, that means that the text in buttons and caption of this message dialogue will automatically adapt to your browser locale. So the preferenced language of your browser for now, we have um, five languages, um, but we count on uh, interacting with you in uh, other countries that we haven't covered yet to extend um, these translations uh, to other, to more languages as well. And finally, there's also the web client connection that is used to connect a data set to an uh, URL from where JSON is retrieved. And for now, uh, we could only set the node uh, one uh, level down in the JSON hierarchy, but now um, you can use a backslash to um, get to JSON data within a JSON structure that is returned uh, multiple levels deep. Let's have a look at uh, a couple of these features to see how this is uh, working and let's first have a look at the brush style so here we have a web paint box and in the code for painting the paint box this is the on paint event handler we show you eight different brush styles so here uh, we set the color to red and we set the style to the brush styles that are available to draw a rectangle of 40 by 40 pixels and uh, at a distance of uh, 50 pixels. So the result will be as in the screenshot on the presentation. And now the good thing is that this is uh, nicely compatible with uh, the VCL. So this is the result of the different brush styles that are built in. Let's have a look at the um, language of the message dialogue. And in this demo, also one line of code, simply showing a message dialogue of the information type with two uh, buttons on it. My browser default language is set to English, and therefore it's normal that um, the message dialogue will show the default text in English. As you can see, it shows information and cancel and retry on these buttons. If I go now to uh, settings and in settings, I can go to language and I can, for example, here move Dutch to the top, making um, Dutch language my preferred language. When I go to the web project, so this is the same running web projects. When I open up the dialog now, you can see that it automatically changed to Dutch language for the buttons and for the uh, caption of this uh, dialog. So let's move this back to English, making English again now the default language. Okay, and that brings us to the topic of material icons to have a look what has been um, new with using material icons. Here, I show you, first of all, 
in the web page control that uh, in each tab you can also use material icons now so each tab has a material glyph that you can uh, configure but also set the color of the glyph as you can see the first one i changed to uh, fuchsia here for example and what more do we have we have the glyph size and we have the glyph type so this is the different styles or types um, that you can select that are available from google material icons uh, noteworthy is that not every symbol within um, the Google material uh, icons have has every uh, style uh, or type different, but when it is available, it will render it in a different way. So here I have for these bit buttons, um, uh, I have specified the person material glyph. And you can see that I have here the material glyph type outlines. Here I have it round. Here we have it sharp. And finally, we have it two tone. Two tone meaning normally the material glyphs are monochrome, uh, but there's also a variant uh, that has a two tone uh, glyph. And now all these are usable from the web core controls. This, of course, is what you see in the IDE. So that means that it is rendered uh, by VCL drawing because that is actually what is happening when you run it in the form designer. But of course, it comes to full effect when you run it in the browser where uh, the real material glyphs are being shown. You can see here, hard to uh, notice difference between this sharp and low or type but you can see uh, clearly the difference between uh, the other types and the two-tone um, glyph here at the bottom where uh, there is a mix of gray and black uh, being used all right and that brings us to what we uh, improved in terms of uh, IDE integration. Um, we improved how the live preview uh, works, so it should work more fluent uh, in 2.0. Let me show you how, um, how actually live preview works and uh, what it can do for you, just in case you um, might not have discovered yet the advantages of live preview. Uh, the best demo I can show it with is the uh, template UI demo, because this demo uses heavily an HTML template for different forms in it. So this is the form as is in the form designer, but there is an uh, HTML template behind it. And so from here, I can trigger live preview. It is now starting, or at least it should start. Let's check again. And for, okay, there it is. I bring it on the appropriate screen here is the live preview so this here is uh, actually um, how it is rendering in the browser using the template that is used in this um, in this form and for example when i would change here the caption search orders and it's Check the browser normally. You can see here that I did nothing, uh, but in the background, this form was actually recompiled. And you can see that the change that I did to the form was automatically applied. Uh, so um, if you have, for example, a dual monitor system, you could have the live preview on one monitor, do your work in the form designer on the main monitor and uh, in the second monitor you will uh, see 
the form as is while you are working in the form designer. So you have an, a live preview of um, the result of what you are doing in the form designer as you are working. What we also changed is, uh, whereas before an, an file in the project manager, uh, you had to remove files one by one by the context menu remove from project. Now we also added the capability to add entire folders from um, the project. Before you really had to go um, one by one, one file by one file, and now you can uh, remove entire folders, especially when you use HTML templates, which typically are organized and come into multiple um, folders. Uh, this can be handy as you can uh, remove such folders uh, at once uh, in case you made a mistake or something is uh, wrong. I see a question here uh, regarding to uh, the live preview. Is it only DFM recompile or with the source recompile for live preview? It is a uh, recompile with source code. So um, it is uh, the full form, including code that is compiled in the background and shown in a separate uh, browser instance. And that brings us to the final um, type of enhancements that have been done in uh, WebCore 2.0, and this concerns new browser APIs that we have also exposed through components. Um, the first of these enhancements is the speech recognition and uh, also the new API for handling multi-screen um, configuration. So uh, this allows you to deal or to figure out, first of all, uh, how many screens are connected to the system where your web client application is running on. And uh, you can position additional uh, windows of your uh, web application on uh, the different monitors that uh, are being returned by the multi-screen API. Um, as uh, we do not have a multi-screen configuration here, uh, within the environment of um, the TMS Web Academy. It's kind of hard to show this, but uh, here is the link to the blog article that explains this. So uh, I invite you to have a look there. Um, in terms of the speech recognition, that's also a kind of hard to uh, demonstrate live here in the Web Academy as obviously this uh, speech recognition requires um, the microphone and the microphone is already in use by the TMS Web Academy, obviously, for um, ensuring that what I'm telling here in this webinar is also heard um, from your side. But I show you um, the application anyway, so you already have a first impression of um, what this is doing. So we have a non-visual uh, speech recognition component. And here is uh, the application, okay. Let's make this somewhat bigger. Okay, so when I enable the microphone here, sadly, I will use the enabled microphone on the Web Academy. So that's why I better not do this. Um, but when I enable this uh, through the microphone, this application can receive commands. So when I simply talk to this application, it will show the text that it could recognize in this uh, memo control here. And um, I can give a couple of commands, like telling uh, the browser clear memo, and then it will automat automatically clear all the text that was already added to the memo. Or I can tell it delete last or delete last line, and then it will just uh, delete the last line that was added. Or I can also give the instruction save uh, to file, and it will perform a download of 
the content of this memo to a text file. How is this organized is via this uh, non-visual speech recognition component that has a collection of possible commands. So these commands you can add yourself. And as you can see here, we have the command clear memo. So when it has uh, heard the instruction clear memo, you can um, execute this code. And obviously this will perform uh, clear on the memo. We also have other commands, save to file, uh, delete line. You can see some uh, specifications here with the uh, double point, uh, which means that this is uh, our line between brackets, which means that this in a command is optional or not. And the double point and the number means that this is a variable within this command that it can extract and return um, for you to use it. Delete last line. So here the line is uh, clearly optional. Delete last would be sufficient. And uh, yeah, th this was another command um, here in this uh, demo. Um, and when uh, no commands are uh, matched from the command list, the text is returned and simply added as text to the memo control. I see uh, some questions in the chat uh, when I press F9 in the IDE. I often have to minimize Delphi uh, manually to see the output in the browser. Um, well, actually, um, my IDE is never configured to automatically minimize. So um, my IDE also always remains open when I press F9. So it looks like um, you refer to the configuration of the IDE to automatically minimize. Um, I would suggest uh, to uh, contact us uh, via support. And also uh, important mention what version of the Delphi IDE you are using. Then we can see if we can reproduce that issue or not. I cannot think of any reason why the IDE would behave different in terms of minimizing when an application has been compiled because our plugin is not interfering with that minimizing process. Uh, but we can always try to figure out when you contact us uh, via support. I see the question, where can I download the version to update? So this is a preview of what will be coming in version 2.0. Um, we are nearly uh, complete with in terms of code and in terms of demos. What is not yet complete is documentation. So that uh, is still ongoing work. As soon as documentation is complete, we will release version 2.0. If you have an active registration, you can already start playing with version 2.0. Just send us an email asking uh, access to the 2.0 beta download, and you can then start playing with it. And um, other question, does the speech recognition is uh, done on the client? Uh, that uh, depends on the browser, actually. So um, here on Windows, the configuration that uh, I'm using, it is uh, done directly in the client. It is not using remote servers, but other browsers and configurations might require an external um, or access to remote servers for helping in this uh, speech recognition process. Uh, another question that I see in the question step, all changes to the CSS class object are cached until update CSS is called. That is a correct assumption. Uh, update CSS is the call that is responsible for uh, triggering within the browser that your CSS class is um, updated. Um, 
another question that I see, how does the new row select feature work with the new uh, button and checkbox controls in a DB grid? Is the editing of the controls disabled in row select mode? Um, so first of all, uh, row selection was already available in uh, the string grid. Uh, it is something that has been added to the table control. And so if you, the first uh, mouse down on a row that has not been selected is uh, optionally when you enable this feature, of course, uh, is allowing you to select that uh, row. And typically editing is started when you click on an already selected uh, cell. So um, both should be uh, usable uh, as you mentioned here in your question. Um, if you have more questions, now is uh, the time to take advantage of uh, being live here and uh, adding your questions either in the chat or the questions step. Um, Another question I see coming now is so you can mix bootstrap via HTML and CSS classes. I'm not sure um, how I should interpret that. Um, bootstrap support has already been in the web core before by specifying bootstrap classes to the control element class name property. Um, and of course, yes, you can uh, use bootstrap classes on controls and you can also use uh, bootstrap in combination with HTML templates that you bind to controls. So uh, lots of options there to uh, look what suits you best. Um, is there any plan to expand DB Grid with inline edit editing controls like a combo box, uh, date time edit? Um, that is actually already possible. So if I drop a uh, DB grid on the form, let's quickly um, create a new application. And at the DB grid on the form, you have the uh, columns property. And in the uh, columns property here, you can select the type of editor for this uh, specific column. So as you can see from there, um, a combo box or a date picker can be used for a column in a uh, grid, in a DB grid uh, control. Um, is there multi-language support on the roadmap? Um, I'm not sure what specifically you um, refer to when talking about multi-language, but note that WebCore has already had uh, a capability to have um, web client applications in uh, different languages. Um, and let me have a look if I can uh, find this multi-language. So under demo basics multi-language, um, you can already see a possible implementation of multi-language. And this one uh, is using the multi-language feature uh, by um, having translated HTML templates for your form and um, the um, application will automatically um, or can automatically change uh, the language by changing the HTML um, template. Here, we this is triggered from um, buttons where you can select the language, but you could tie that to uh, the browser locale and retrieve the language from there. Bring the form in view and here you can see default it is english when i click german it uh, opens up the german version or the french uh, version so if we have a look at what is happening when i click uh, these uh, buttons you can see that i use application change language and 
when application change language is called, it will load the template with the language suffix. You can see here the uh, German template uh, that has the suffix underscore DE, the English one and the French one. So um, I invite you to have a look there um, for a possible implementation of uh, multi-language. Okay, and I believe that this was it so far in terms of uh, questions. Uh, if you have more questions, now is the time to uh, take this opportunity. Um, one more thing that I wanted to uh, show you do during this webinar is also brand new information. It's actually published from today. And this is a uh, new um, hands-on training course uh, that focuses on Xdata. Xdata, that is the kind of preferred backend for your web core applications, the REST server that you can use in combination with web core. A lot of our users are using that uh, Xdata backend with web core. Um, and this is an ideal uh, source of information. So here uh, you can find all information in our blog post of today related to a new training course that is available for you. Um, I believe it's like 15 hours of content, if I'm correct. And uh, check it out. It's uh, available all the details and the links to the appropriate pages can be found from our blog. So um, that was it, what we planned for today. Um, as I mentioned, we are working hard on finishing 2.0. If you have an active registration and feel like uh, testing it out, uh, contact us by email. We provide you the latest beta build and we keep working hard to finish the documentation and to have this uh, released hopefully somewhere uh, next week. Also, an important thing to add is uh, we have now today shown um, the WebCore 2.0 framework in the Delphi IDE. Our goal is to also bring this to the Lazarus IDE and of course also bring this to the visual studio code ide so the exact same framework 2.0 will be coming shortly to visual studio code as well so you can use your preferred ide to develop object pascal based web applications uh, from your favorite ide that was it for today Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thanks for your interest in WebCore and also in Xdata, of course. Um, let us know also via email or the support center if you have further requests, IDs, um, things that you want to see added or enhanced in WebCore 2.0 is far from the end. Um, so after 2.0, Point oh, we start further development and your uh, guiding is, of course, uh, extremely appreciated to um, make it, uh, to, to let it evolve in the direction that you want. So be in touch and um, we continue our work. For now, thanks for your time and have a great remainder of the day until the next webinar in the future. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.